name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. <coughs> Our Lady, seat of wisdom. Saint Joseph. Saint Pope Saint Gregory the Great. Our patron saints and guardian angels. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Gregory the Great, one of the four great doctors of the Western Latin Church. Um, he is the patron saint of teachers because of his great ability to instruct the faithful. And you might say that St. Gregory the Great was a pastor of pastors. He was a good shepherd of shepherds. He knew how to teach pastors, shepherds, how to shepherd. And he taught them principles by which they should conduct themselves in taking care of their flocks. And that's probably why he's a doctor of the church, is for his moral teaching and his pastoral uh, teaching that he left the church uh, as part of his legacy. It says that St. Gregory the Great was born in, at Rome about the year 540. He was the son of Gord Gordianus, a wealthy senator who later renounced the world and became one of the seven deacons of Rome. After he had acquired the usual thorough education, Emperor Justin the Younger appointed Gregory in 574 to be the chief magistrate of Rome. He was only 34 years of age. That's like being the, the highest civil ruler of the city of Rome, which was probably, a, in that sense, a city-state. After the death of his father, Gregory built six monasteries in Sicily and found a seventh one in his own house in Rome, which became the Benedictine Monastery of St. Saint Andrew, where he himself uh, put on the Benedictine habit in 575. So he's only a chief magistrate of Rome for one year before he became a Benedictine monk. And after the death of Pelagius, St. Gregory was chosen by the Pope to be the unanimous, cons by the unanimous, was chosen Pope by the unanimous consent of priests and the people. And then he began those great labors which have merited for him the title of great. His zeal extended over the entire church, entire, in the entire world. He was in contact with all the churches of Christendom, and in spite of his bodily sufferings and innumerable labors, he found time to compose a great number of works. Uh, maybe to pray to St. Gregory the Great that uh, we have that grace, you know, it's hard enough to to do many things when you have sufferings. You know, it's hard to even think sometimes. And yet he composed very great works. You know, he wrote very intellectual things, even though he went under, he underwent many sufferings in his body and, and I'm sure uh, was a cross that he had to carry. So we, he's an inspiration in that he did not allow that to keep him from carrying out his great work and writing his treatises. He's known above all for his magnificent contributions to the liturgy of the mass and office. It is through his uh, work that we have what is now Gregorian chant. He was the one who recognized that there was this beautiful music that had been passed on to the church. I think um, some believe that Gregorian chant those melodies may even have been used even in the uh, temple and in, in the Old Covenant. Uh, because one time, Father Fessio relates that uh, a Jesuit priest, I don't know if it was him or a friend of his, was wanting to know how the Jews recited the Psalms in the temple since they sang them, they chanted them. And so he went to see a very well-known rabbi who was quite uh, intellectual and he asked him, he said, how did you Jews pray the, the Psalms in the temple? He said, well, the Jew, the rabbi responded, well, you should know. You've been doing it in your church all the time with your Gregorian chant. Uh, it's some of the same 
melody. So uh, obviously the church has, is the, has retained the patrimony of a, a many of the good things in the old covenant that were uh, used in the worship and incorporated into our liturgy today. Of course, we know the, the holy sacrifice of the mass is the fulfillment and completion of the Seder meal, you know, uh, what our Lord did on the night of Passover, we do it in its fulfillment, what it was all about, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But Saint, Pope St. Gregory was very much interested in beautifying the liturgy and, and maintaining uh, tradition and bringing about uh, the well-ordering of the church and guiding pastors. So we have much to thank God for Pope St. Gregory, and we ask that through his intercession in heaven especially, we will uh, um, put into practice his great wisdom that he received from God in teaching shepherds how to shepherd the flocks. That's a very important thing. Um, St. Paul even touches upon it in the first reading. You know, he says that he couldn't give his people solid food because they weren't ready for it. Because one of the things that they were doing was they were kind of starting up little fan clubs or little factions where they were pitting one uh, pastor over another. You know, one, I'm for Apollo and I'm for Paul. And, and uh, he said that whoever they are, whether they be Apollos or Paul, they're all doing the same work for the one God who is really the one who is the source of any of the good that they're able to do. Sometimes you see this same kind of mentality in the church today where they like to pit one pope against another. You know, oh, Pope Paul VI was this, and Pope John Paul was that, and Pope Pius XII was this. And, but you know, they all, were, they all were doing the work of the Holy Spirit. They all were elected by the Holy Spirit one who chose them to do whatever task it was at that time in the church. Pope Francis today has been called by the Holy Spirit to carry out whatever the tasks are that God has for him to do. And we pray that Pope Francis, like we pray that every pope before him, will be faithful to carry out what God wants him to do. And that's why we must pray for the, our Holy Father, because he has a big cross to carry. We want him to do all that God wants him to do and do nothing more than what God wants him to do. And in doing what God wants him to do, as especially the chief uh, shepherd of the flock, the church will be guided through the troubled waters of the world and the difficulties of our day. And so it's good that we support our pastors, but especially the chief shepherd of the flock, our Holy Father, with our prayers. And as Pope John Paul II uh, one time intimated, he said that, uh, that uh, everybody who prays the rosary, there's always some grace that is given through every rosary that is prayed, especially for the Holy Father and for his uh, welfare and spiritual guidance and the graces that he needs to carry out his tasks. So remember that as we pray the rosary that we are helping to strengthen and to assist the Holy Father to carry out his task. Today, as we honor Pope St. Gregory, let us pray for all pastors of the church, that they may truly be guided and be true shepherds of the flock. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.